I'd like to organize the 40 minutes that we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, prepared remarks by talking about two problems to which so the solution is Bitcoin and blockchain. And I'm going to frame them in an Austrian way, but do it in, in maybe a little bit non-Austrian, not precise Austrian methods, because I believe that some of the Austrian methods have been a little too narrow, and we've missed some things, and I'll explain that as I go through. But the problems I'm talking about are the moneyness of credit and inaccuracies in Wall Street ledger systems. The moneyness of credit is a phrase that Doug Noland, one of my favorite accountant, uh, economists, uses. He's not strictly Austrian, but he wrote, writes the credit bubble bulletin. And, uh, and, and history will be very kind to his chronicling of the credit bubble that we've been in for the last 30 years. And what he means by moneyness of credit is that debt instruments in the fixed income markets, things like bonds, treasury bonds, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac bonds, actually function as money and in institutional markets. And I'll go into that and explain why that has helped proliferate the debt bubble that we're in. The second problem is Wall Street's ledgers are inaccurate. Inherently, they lose track of who really owns what, and we should not trust our brokerage statements. The solution to both of these problems, which of course both stem from the fact that we have unsound money, is creating sound money, creating an honest ledger system. Uh, the current system creates more claims to wealth than there is real wealth in the economy, and yet the solution is, is fixing that. It's right in front of our faces with this new technology. I'm not going to give you a downer of a speech, though, in talking about these problems, because I th I'm actually quite optimistic. Bitcoin is, is what makes me optimistic that the future is not bleak. It is history's first universally honest ledger. It's the only one that truly exists in many ways. And it has fomented the rise of a parallel financial system that is now quite large, and I'll explain. All of us have read Murray Rothbard's Mystery of Banking. That book was written in 1983. Hold that date in your mind. But I believe, and he, he explains how fractional reserve banking works in, in this book. Uh, we all understand how it works in the traditional banking system. You take a dollar of monetary base, and it gets multiplied up into $10 of M2. But the reality is, that's not how the financial system works anymore. And most of the credit that has been created in the last 25 years has been created outside of the traditional banking system. It still exists, but it's just not that meaningful. What's more meaningful is the shadow banking system. And I believe that if Rothbard were alive, he would have written a, sub, uh, a sequel to The Mystery of Banking, which would be called The Mystery of Shadow Banking. That's a book that I very much hope that an academic picks up and writes. And that's because money has taken on a much broader definition in, in the securities markets than the traditional definitions of, of, of fiat money. Effectively, money is anything that can be financed in the securities financing markets, especially that which the primary dealers can finance at the Fed, either through the repo market or through the discount window. And that means treasury bonds, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds, um, mortgage-backed securities, even corporate bonds effectively become money because they can be financed at the discount window and in the repo market. A repurchase agreement is a, an, an agreement to pledge a security in exchange for a loan of cash and then repurchase it later at an agreed price. So that's an implicit discount rate. Most of the repo market is overnight. And in fact, actually, instead of um, the Fed injecting monetary base into the traditional banking system, the Fed creates money by injecting monetary base into the repo market. It is a very important market that is not well understood by Austrians, and I think that that's one of the reasons, um, as I'll talk in a little bit, why some of the Austrians missed the impact of the financial crisis, uh, predicting that we would see hyperinflation, and we didn't. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But the, the degree of moneyness of fixed income assets um, fluctuates. It ebbs and flows. Sometimes the repo market will finance non-investment grade bonds. Sometimes they won't. There, there's no bid for those. Um, but, but what got me down this path was scratching my head, wondering why sometimes in the repo market, treasury bonds are more valuable than cash. You actually have a negative interest rate to borrow a treasury bond. It's what's called the general collateral financing rate, GCF rate. When, when periodically that goes negative, what that means is that 
In the institutional money markets, treasuries are more valuable than cash. And the reason is that they can be repo, they can be rehypothecated and, and leveraged multiple times, whereas cash cannot be. The impact of all of this, I won't spend more time on the definition of it, but I wanted to lay it out because the impact of all of this is ballooning debt, particularly since 1983, uh, when, when Rothbard happened to write his book. And again, I think if he were alive, he would have, he would have gotten, he would have known this, he would have been all on top of it. But let's, let's explain, let's, let's d dive into now some of the numbers, explaining why the moneyness of credit has resulted in this monstrosity that it's on, on the graph right here, which is non-financial sector debt. We're now in the United States at 72 trillion of non-financial sector debt. Um, and as you see, there's been no deleveraging, has not actually declined. Um, and I, I, I'm focusing on non-financial sector debt instead of total debt for one simple reason. The financial sector intermediates debt out into the real economy. And so if you look at total debt where you, can, you count financial sector and non-financial sector debt, you're actually double counting. Um, the real borrowers in the economy are, of course, outside of the financial sector, and that's why I focus on this. And, and it turns out this, this analysis, if you define money and credit more broadly and to include the entire fixed income market effectively, what you're picking up is some very interesting things about the economy. Um, of course, in here, in this, you see that uh, the federal government was the bulk of the increase in the borrowing, uh, as well as the state and local governments and the Fed itself since the financial crisis. We're going to track this area under, uh, in, in this graph, as a, as a single red line in the next couple of charts. And there's our red line, our total non-financial sector debt. Up, uh, is now 72 trillion. That's just the, uh, the sum of all of the uh, air, um, different colors in the previous graph. But what I've added to this chart is cumulative private sector savings. This is an Austrian analysis, in effect, by saying that we need to compare the amount of debt that's been borrowed to the amount of savings that was saved. Because, as you know, Mises would say that the amount of debt that was borrowed from real savings is legitimate debt. He called that commodity credit. And the amount of debt that was borrowed in excess of real savings was the illegitimate debt, the, the circulation credit. And in effect, this chart puts some numbers to that. Um, everything from zero up until the green line is commodity credit, in effect. That's the legitimate amount of debt. Uh, everything between the green line and the red line is the circulation credit. And it turns out that, as you see, the red line is significantly above the green line. And that cumulatively since World War II, almost entirely since we went off the gold standard, we've borrowed $40.5 trillion of excess debt. In effect, $2 of debt for every $1 of savings in the US economy since World War II. We're going to cover, we're, going to, we're now going to look at this, this exact same data set, except instead of looking at the stock, we're going to look at the flow. Instead of looking at the period end amounts outstanding, we're going to look at the change. And it turns out, and we're going to look, follow that in the next three slides, it turns out that there's some tremendously interesting observations that you can pull out of both about the economy and about financial markets by looking at it this way. So there's our red line, except now we're looking at the change in debt borrowed. And the green line is just the amount of savings in, in, in each of those quarterly periods dating back to uh, just after World War II. But what I wanted to, to share with you here is that if you look at the left-hand side of the chart, the red and green lines are basically right on top of each other. Uh, that's not a function of the scale of the chart. That is a function of the fact that we actually had a tether on the amount of debt that could be created in the financial system. It was called the gold standard. And before 1968, it turns out, uh, that uh, those two lines in any given year were, one, one might be a little bit ahead of the other, but they'd always equal out. It was just a timing difference. Uh, if you, if you d dive into the numbers, we really truly were an equity financed economy where the amount of debt that was borrowed was actually equal to the amount of savings saved in the economy prior to 1968. 1968, we started cheating, as we know, for, because of guns and butter. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, every year except for one, you see where the financial crisis was right there, a little itty bitty bit of deleveraging in one year, um, in one quarter actually. Uh, but debt has, debt has increased savings every year since we broke the tether on debt growth, which was the gold standard. 
And now let's look at that same graph in to highlighting two different things, which is monetary policy decisions. The first one, of course, we just talked about. We all know in 1971, we broke the tether on debt growth by abandoning Bretton Woods uh, after having been cheating since 1968. But it turns out, I think, the bigger, yeah, maybe not the bigger mistake, but a, a tremendous mistake that I haven't seen anyone write about happened in 1982. Remember, Rothbard wrote his book in 1983. And that was when the Fed shifted from targeting the quantity of credit to targeting the price of credit. When they did that, they gave the keys to the kingdom, to the financial sector, to create as much debt as it wanted as long as the price of credit, the Fed funds rate, remained in the target area. And that's when we really started to see, and you see it on the chart, Beginning in 1983, under, under Volcker, you really started to see that red line start to take off relative to the green line. And ever since then, the financial sector has gone to town creating debt. That was a tremendously colossal error. It happened again under Volcker. Um, and it, what's interesting is they never announced it. So Rothbard wouldn't have been able to pick it up at the time unless he were reading the Fed minutes, which were released so, several years later. I only found it through because of an academic who was writing about it, um, understanding that, that it just happened in one, in one meeting. It was never publicly announced. But you can see how it, that was a meaningful change. Instead of targeting the quantity of credit and trying to control M1, they were now targeting the price of credit and ever since then have targeted the Fed's, Fed funds rate. Now let's look at that same data set but highlight different things. It turns out that every time that red line grows a lot faster than the green line, we have a financial market bubble. And I'm tracing five bubbles here, but only the first of which happened before that fateful 1983 decision. And you see in 1974, we had a financial market bubble. The S&P went from 68 to 107 between 1974 and 1976, and then it crashed. Um, and and then, then, uh, then we have that fateful decision beginning in 1983 where you really start to see the debt numbers take off. Uh, and we ha that culminated in the 87 crash. Then you see in the late 90s, the third bubble is the tech stock bubble. And then, of course, the housing bubble, which is the biggest one to date, at least by these metrics. Uh, and then I believe we are in a government finance bubble. And uh, we're not at the end of that bubble yet. And that is probably the granddaddy of them all. So how much debt capacity remains? If you look at it on this basis, um, it's an interesting question because it helps to explain why we haven't had the collapse yet. A lot of Austrians were saying when we abandoned the gold standard in 1971, the dollar was going to collapse. But I think what, what was missed at that point in time was an understanding that we had a tremendous balance sheet. There was basically no debt, on, no net debt on the balance sheet of the United States at that point in time. Because our grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents has, had bequeathed us a tremendous balance sheet with which, against which we could start to borrow. And we really started borrowing beginning in 1968, as you saw, and we haven't stopped. We haven't, we haven't gone to, t we've gone to town. But that, the blue line I've introduced in this chart is U.S. net wealth. And you notice it's always above the red line. U.S. net wealth is the amount of unencumbered assets owned by Americans, unencumbered by debt. The red line is the total amount of non-financial sector debt. Some, you may be thinking, aren't, aren't I double counting because I'm, I'm pulling out the debt from net wealth and then I'm comparing it again to the debt. What I'm really trying to get at is, at a macro level, I know we hate that word, um, but at a, when you aggregate all the borrowings of individuals and aggregate all the assets of individuals, how many unencumbered assets are there that can support all that dollar-denominated debt? And it turns out that there are more. The total amount of, of, of US net wealth right now is 92 trillion, and the total amount of non-financial sector debt is 72 trillion. We're adding about two and a half to three trillion of non-financial sector debt a year. So what this suggests potentially is that it could keep going. I think it more specifically explains why the dollar hasn't collapsed yet, because there's asset value implicitly supporting the dollar. That's the spread between the blue and red lines. Um, but here's the, the fly in the ointment of this analysis. It's circular because the asset value is supported by the debt itself. Um, and so at some point, uh, uh, this is not to say that we're going to continue forever um, being able to support asset values with, uh, con with issuing more debt and pushing interest rates down. Um, and, and, and there's a $20 trillion spread right now between the total US net wealth and non-financial sector debt. 
But remember the circulation credit that will in theory be liquidated is 40 and a half trillion. So it does suggest that unfortunately this is not gonna end well. This doesn't help tell us when it's gonna end, but it helps I think explain why we didn't see the crash and the, and the end of the dollar yet. Let me turn now to the second problem, which is issues in Wall Street's ledger systems that are prone to inaccuracies. And it's related to the earlier problem. I'll, I'll, correct the, I'll, I'll connect them in a moment. But the way securities used to work was very simple. Issuers issued the this, this stock certificates in paper form to the investor. What I say by investor there is either you individually or through your agent, like a pension fund or a mutual fund or an insurance company. But you always owned the, the stock certificate in paper form. That's how it used to work. Since 1994, we've got this very convoluted pro, uh, uh, procedure here where you see that the issuer issues securities to a company called CD & Co, which is owned by the Depository Trust Corporation. And then the custodians hold the securities on your behalf. So there are a minimum of three, sometimes five or six layers between you and the issuer. When I first figured this out, it was amazing. I was working in capital markets and looking at a bond prospectus, and in the prospectus is language that says that the issuer of the bond has no obligation to pay interest in principal to the investor. Think about that. That is expressly in the bond prospectus. You are buying a bond, and you are not getting an obligation to pay interest in principal from the issuer. What's happening is the issuer is paying CD and Co who has an obligation to pay the custodian, who has an obligation to pay you. These layers of intermediaries create unnecessary counterparty risk, operational risk, and the risk that the system gets out of sync because each one of those layers is reconciling against each other and until five, more like 10 years ago, all of these companies batch processed their transactions overnight. Well, that's part of the reason why it took three days, now, to, now it's two days, to settle securities transactions, because it's got to go through layers of intermediaries, each one of them needing a day overnight to process the transactions. And so you can see that, that this system inherently foments inaccuracies, because they're not all going to be in sync at the same time, and it also creates settlement delays where it, takes, it requires two days to settle securities transactions. However, the technology no longer requires that. We've long past moved the need to have this crazy system, but we're stuck with the legacy. What are the problems? Some of you are probably skeptical and thinking, I trust my brokerage account. I trust my broker. They, they're, I've never found a mistake. I, they're honest. Well, let me give you some examples. The first one was just about a year ago in litigation in Delaware, Dole Food. There was a class action lawsuit, and it, uh, the details are not important, but here's, here's, here's what matters. There were 36.7 million shares of Dole Food outstanding, and in a class action lawsuit, there were 49.2 million claimants to the, to the consideration in the class action lawsuit. Again, 49.2 million people had valid brokerage statements showing that they owned Dole Food shares, all of whom had valid brokerage statements. 49.2 million, but there were really only 36.7 million Dole Food shares outstanding. That's what Patrick Byrne will call the bezel uh, when he talks uh, in, in a moment. Um, if that makes you not trust your brokerage statement, good, because I don't trust mine. All of those 49.2 million w showed up on valid, valid brokerage statements. And again, it's because of these layers of intermediaries that can get out of whack at any given moment in time. Procter & Gamble, you might have read there was a big proxy fight. It was all over the, the, the business newspapers at the end of last year. Well, in the first count in the proxy vote, it came out that Procter & Gamble's candidate won by 6.2 million votes. They did a second count, and it turned out that the challenger, Nelson Peltz, won by 42,780 votes. And then they did a third count, and it swung back. Procter & Gamble won by 498,312 votes. Let me go through that again. The first vote was plus 6.2 million. The second was minus 42,780, and the third was 498, plus 498,312. If this doesn't give you any confidence in financial systems, good, because it shows you how wildly inaccurate the accounting systems are that we can't even get an accurate proxy vote count. 
the reality is Procter & Gamble, after that third count, threw in the towel and said, and it invited Nelson Peltz on the board. They had already spent $125 million between them fighting over that board seat. And they knew there was no possibility of getting an, an accurate vote count. And so they just decided to stop fighting and, uh, and invited Nelson Peltz on the board. Yahoo had a similar situation. There was a recount of a proxy contest that revealed 20% of the votes had been miscounted. Um, I won't go into the details about Dell. They're a little more complicated, but the gist is it cost T. Rowe Price $194 million because of something that wasn't even their fault related to the fact that, that they were no longer the record owner of the securities. Um, I personally ran into a situation where I observed unauthorized securities lending happening in a pension fund that would not have been discoverable because it wasn't showing up on the brokerage statements. There's a lot of shenanigans that happen behind the scenes in the accounting systems, and they're inherently, um, uh, they inherently just don't, keep, they don't stay in sync with each other. But here's the granddaddy of them all. You notice the, the oh, by the way, on the right, bottom right, I actually put the title of a speech, The Blockchain Plunger. There's a judge in Delaware who's been a huge supporter of blockchain technology. Uh, and his speech that he gave to the Council of Institutional Investors is called The Blockchain Plunger, Using Technology to Clean Up Proxy Voting and Take Back the Vote. He's a huge believer that the current system is fundamentally broken, and we need to deploy blockchain in order to fix it. Um, but on the upper right is the granddaddy of them all, the market that most um, overissues securities through the ledger's uh, accounting systems of Wall Street, and that's the US Treasury market. Um, there's an IMF economist who's done a study to try to estimate how much treasuries have been overissued. And he doesn't call it that. He calls it collateral velocity. It's back to that repo market I was talking about. The repo market is how most funding happens in how most money and credit is created in the financial system. It's a huge market. It's, it trades on average $4.6 trillion a day in the United States. And he estimates how many times a single treasury bond has been posted as collateral. The very same treasury bond has been posted two times as collateral, down from three times since the financial crisis. So there's been a little bit of deleveraging. But in plain English, what that means is that one in every three parties who thinks they own a US treasury security actually does, because there's really only one treasury security. And even though all those financial institutions are reporting that they own the treasury security because that's how repo accounting works, the way it works is you put a dollar of debt against that asset and then you turn around and repledge that asset and the other party puts a dollar of debt against that same asset. And that keeps happening. That's, that's how fractional reserve banking happens in the shadow banking system. And it happens on a much larger base because remember money in the shadow banking system includes every, every treasury bond and Fannie Mae and Freddie, Freddie Mac bonds too. Whereas the Fed's balance sheet in the traditional banking system is a much smaller number. So what effectively he's saying, you know, when you think about um, in the traditional banking system, M0 t typically gets multiplied by 10 to become M2. Well, the M0 of the shadow banking system is a much larger base, and that gets multiplied by two uh, to get a much, big, much, much bigger number. In effect, this is, um, this is a, a, a money creation regime that we don't really understand, and it's very opaque, but this economist has done a tremendous amount of work identifying just how overissued government bonds, it's not just in the US, but, um, but all over the world is. So that ties back that moneyness of credit point to the fact that the accounting systems of Wall Street don't keep track, keep accurate track of who owns what. It's a game of musical chairs, and it's not going to end well. If I'd given this speech to you in 2014 or 2013, I would have ended here, and it would have been a downer, because it would have made everybody feel really uncomfortable. But um, the good news is we have a solution. And that is history's first honest ledger. And that is a blockchain, a universally honest ledger. It is a ledger system that is governed by the laws of math, not the laws of man. And therefore, it can't be tampered with because the laws of math are immutable and there is no subjectivity in it. A blockchain allows multiple parties to see the same data at the same time and trust that it's valid. Again, a blockchain in simple terms allows multiple parties to see the same data at the same time and trust that it's valid. 
It is a new form of database technology that creates a single golden copy that all of the parties can share, shared infrastructure. That's why the banks are all interested in this. They all keep their own copies of ledgers and then reconcile against each other. Well, if there's a way that they can keep only one ledger and not have to reconcile, they can cut a lot of costs out. Maybe they can cut all the time to settlement of securities transactions and payments out too. Bitcoin was the first blockchain. It was created in October 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who he, she, or they is or were, um, but what Satoshi did was create the first truly denationalized money that wasn't specie. It has a finite number. It, no, it will never have more than 21 million Bitcoins issued by algorithm that, that really can't be changed. Um, I'll talk about th that in a minute. But what Satoshi's breakthrough was, was he solved what's called the Byzantine generals problem, which is the, the um, a computer science problem that, that computer scientists had been grappling with for almost 40 years, which is when information moves across time and space, how do you know that it hasn't been tampered with in between where it was sent and where it was received? This was, they called it the Byzantine generals problem because in Byzantine times, the generals were sending messages back and forth to each other on the battlefield, information moving across time and space. How do you know that the information that was received is exactly the information that was sent? And Satoshi solved that by creating a brilliant system that is not just about technology. In fact, the brilliance of the system is that it's a combination of technology and game theory. And this is a very important thing to understand. It's built on both cryptography and incentives, economic incentives. I'll talk about that more in a bit, but it's not just about technology. It's very much about understanding incentives. And because of that beautiful balance of technology and incentives, it's never been hacked. You may think, gosh, wait a minute, I read about hacks all the time. The hacks that have happened have happened on applications that were built on top of the underlying Bitcoin blockchain. But the underlying Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked. And it's been out, out there for almost 10 years now. And no one's figured out how to hack it. And it's got a heck of a hacker's bounty. It's now worth about $140 billion. And keep in mind, it's sitting out there with no firewall in the wilds of the internet with everybody attacking it every day. Because of its balance, beautiful balance between technology and economic incentives, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has withstood all of those attacks. It's also a marvel of technology, though. Let me give you the network uptime statistics since the first Bitcoin was mined on January 3rd, 2009. And that is 99.992294%. That is in excess of Six Sigma quality control. And the crazy thing about it is there's no system administrator. They do network upgrades on the fly. They don't take the network down. It is an incredible piece of software but it's an even more incredible piece of money uh, because of, again, the incentives that are built into the system. In general, the Bitcoin network has had everything go up and to the right in terms of the number of users, the number of wallets, the hash rate, which is the computer processing power supporting the network, and in general, the price. Obviously, it fluctuates wildly, but it is still in a, in a bull market uptrend technically. Um, and, and, it's, and, and the things that have happened in this market are just crazy. Coinbase, which is the largest player in the market, was opening 100,000 accounts a day in November and December of last year. And that company's not even five years old, and it now has more customers than Schwab. So it's crazy what's happened in this sector. It does indicate, of course, a speculative frenzy, but it also indicates a desire for something other than a financial system that I think most people understand isn't fair and doesn't quite work the way we want it to. Let me talk about the two Austrian objections to Bitcoin. I put the, the regression theorem on this slide, but there's another one that's more general that I hear, and it's related, which is Bitcoin's not backed by anything. That's what Peter Schiff, uh, Peter Schiff's big, big uh, uh, critique of Bitcoin is. Um, but a lot of Austrian scholars critique it and stayed away from it because of, the, of, of thinking that it violated the regression theorem. And in fact, the answer to both of these critiques is the same, which is that Bitcoin is really a payment system inter inextricably intertwined with the token. It's not right to compare Bitcoin against the dollar or yen or euro. 
it's apples to apples to compare Bitcoin against the dollar, yen, euro, et cetera, plus Visa and MasterCard and Fiserv and Fidelity National and all of the companies in the payments ecosystem that process and confirm transactions. And so what's backing Bitcoin? What's backing Bitcoin is that payment system. It's the service that people are willing to pay for in the form of, in the case of Bitcoin, being diluted by the inflation that happens as the miners are paid new Bitcoins as they mine, as they confirm transactions. That is what backs Bitcoin. There is a utility to it. There is a use value to it. It is the payment processing system. In fact, the US payment system, I looked it up, has a market value of $600 billion, and that's just the S&P payment sector. There are a lot of other technology companies that make the, you know, the hardware in the payment system, like the ATMs and the point of system swipe machines for credit cards and the like, that are not included in that $600 billion number. Um, so there's, there's clearly value to payment systems. And what I think these critics are missing is that the value of Bitcoin is that the payment system is intertwined. You cannot separate it from the token. And indeed, that's how I would answer the, the critique of the regression theory theorem. The regression theorem says that the origin of money is that it was a commodity that became valuable in exchange. And we can trace money back to the actual uh, commodity that was used in exchange in barter transactions and that money's initial value must have use value. Well, in fact, actually, I would argue that Bitcoin's use value is that payment system. And in the beginning, Bitcoin didn't have value um, because it was just simply a, a, a unit of account in a ledger. But then people started using that ledger to confirm transactions and keep track of value. Once people started using that ledger, then Bitcoin started to have value. That is the utility. That is how we can trace that it spontaneously arose as a commodity. It had utility. And that's how I would answer that it doesn't violate the regression theorem. And hopefully walking through that made you think a little bit, uh, if, you're, if there are skeptics among us, which I'm sure there are, I'm actually in the process of doing some research, digging into valuing Bitcoin as if you were valuing it the same way you'd value Visa or MasterCard. Looking at all the cash flows in terms of transaction fees and that block reward that's thrown off of the Bitcoin network and valuing it uh, valuing those cash flows using a discounted cash flow model, um, just the way an equity research analyst would, or, or, or looking at the return on invested capital relative to the invested capital. Bitcoin has a much, much, much lower invested capital in confirming payments than the existing payment system does. Think about all the bricks and mortar in the existing payment system, all of those, all that hardware at every merchant that has a credit card machine, right? You don't need any of that in Bitcoin, Not a, none of it. So it's a very capital light um, technology, a, pay, a payment system, and therefore the return on invested capital is going to be a lot higher. And so per transaction, the Bitcoin system, in theory, if you looked at it the way an equity analyst would, is worth a lot more, and so you'd pay a much higher multiple than you would for a Visa and MasterCard, which has to have all that, all that bricks and mortar, all that hardware. Uh, I haven't done that analysis yet, so that's a theory. Um, I'll report back at some point when I get that done. Uh, but I'm, I'm almost positive that that's going to justify Bitcoin's value um, in some zip code. Again, if the total payment syst system in the US is worth 600 billion and Bitcoin, which is much more efficient, is worth 140 billion, that tells you um, it's actually not that far off. And that 600 billion payment system value, I think, is, under, is understated. Uh, um, and by the way, that's just the U.S. as well. So um, more, more to come on that. Um, I, I just have two more slides, but this one I need to spend some time on because there is a tour de force book. Some of you have probably read it, but as I've chit-chatted with folks, a lot of you didn't know this existed. It's been out for three weeks. It's called The Bitcoin Standard, and it's written by an Austrian. I've never met him. Uh, Amos, I assume, is how you pronounce his name. It's called The Bitcoin Standard, The Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking, and he is a professor of economics at Lebanese American University. This should be in everyone's library, every, uh, every, every Austrian's library. Um, it is a tour de force. That the first seven chapters get into the history of money leading up to why Bitcoin is so special and so unique. And to me, there's so many things you can take away from this book, but to me, the big thing 
is that money historically has been supplanted by new versions of money when technological innovations come in and, and, uh, and necessitate the move to a different form of money. Uh, he goes through the, the ray stones in Yap Island, some of you are probably very familiar with that, and how it su they, they suddenly ceased being money um, when somebody figured out a way to produce them. But the reason why they retained their value for so many years in that economy was because they had a high stock to flow ratio, uh, high, uh, yeah, stock to flow ratio and were so expensive to produce which is analogous to what Bitcoin is. I want to read a few uh, quotes from his, um, from his book because I think they'll help you understand just how special the book is, but more importantly, how special Bitcoin is. One uh, is, whereas in a mo modern central bank, the new money created goes to finance lending and government spending, in Bitcoin, the new money goes only to those who spend resources on updating the ledger. That's pretty interesting. There's never been money created where those who create the, who, who create the new money, who mine the gold or silver or uh, co collect the seashells. There's never been money where the seniorage went back into the, it, the, the money itself. And that's how Bitcoin was designed. The people who get the benefit of the inflation are the ones who are securing the network and confirming the transactions. Here's another one. Bitcoin is the hardest money ever invented. Growth in the value cannot possibly increase its supply. It can only make the network more secure and immune to attack. As more people come into Bitcoin, the incentive for more CPU, more, more computer power to process the transactions increases because the miners can make more money. So you get more and more secure as, uh, as more and more people come into Bitcoin. But that does not change the supply of Bitcoin. So again, the incentives are very nicely aligned. The difficulty adjustment, which is essentially that the math problem becomes harder as Bitcoin goes up and more people come into the network, uh, the math problem that the miners have to solve. The difficulty adjustment is the most reliable technology for making hard money and limiting the stock to flow ratio from rising. And it makes Bitcoin fundamentally different from any other money. Again, if we get a big discovery of gold, that's going to cause the value of gold to drop because it's becoming cheaper to produce. But in Bitcoin, if you get a big discovery, as in a whole bunch of people come into the network, Bitcoin becomes more expensive to produce. That's in part what keeps it so valuable. And there is no other money like it. Bitcoin and cryptography in general are defensive technologies that make the cost of defending property and information far lower than the cost of attacking them. That's an incredible statement because it means that the cost of defending your property right is a lot cheaper than the cost of somebody trying to take it away from you. And again, that's the design of Bitcoin. I really hope you dig into this book. But the last chart, the, the last co uh, comment that, uh, that uh, I'll share is I think the most poignant, which is the Bitcoin ledger of transactions might just be the only objective set of facts in the world. And that is because of the verification methodology in Bitcoin. There's, you've heard the phrase, lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? Um, there is no such thing in Bitcoin because everything on the Bitcoin network has been verified using math. And it cannot, it's, it's immutable, it cannot be changed. It is, folks, the first honest ledger in history, and that is why it's so powerful. Let me end by talking about... How this, tech, how this sector has, has flourished. And Patrick Byrne, I'm sure, is going to pick this up in talking about something called utility tokens or securities tokens. Blockchain has now been used to effectively issue what, it, what are securities-like instruments, but they're not securities. They are something called utility tokens. They are issued and traded and settled on a blockchain, but they're redeemable for consumptive goods. So you can now download music on a company called, on a blockchain called Ujo, or you can uh, trade photographs on Kodak Coins blockchain, um, or airline miles, I suspect, will probably eventually be on blockchains, issued and traded on blockchains. And, and my native state of Wyoming, <laughs> as Jeff said, did something really interesting. We passed five blockchain bills. I spent the entire month of February in Wyoming with, um, with this gentleman, Tyler Lindholm. 
Um, he's, he's my hero. Uh, by the way, it's funny, it was, when I was at the Satoshi Roundtable, right before I went to Wyoming, I predicted, I said, there's this guy who's very Ron Paul-like in Wyoming, and he, he's going to help us get these bills passed, and the skeptics in the room said, well, then they're, of course they're going to fail. But in fact, actually, we got them all through, and, and two of them were, were passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. And, and the most important one in, in some respects is the utility token bill, which exempts utility tokens from securities and money transmission laws in the state of Wyoming. We also exempted crypto assets from the money transmission laws generally, and we exempted crypto assets from property tax. There's already no income tax. So we made Wyoming this really, really interesting state from the perspective of the crypto industry. And by the way, Tyler got through a bill independent of this that recognizes specie as legal tender. Um, we're going to be working on, uh, on getting crypto assets recognized as legal tender in Wyoming uh, next. So, um, so, so we can uh, always come back to those who say that, uh, that the dollar has to exist because we have to pay our taxes in it. Well, legal tender in these states that recognize specie as legal tender can be something other than the U.S. dollar. Uh, and the same thing can, uh, is true if we can get crypto assets recognized as legal tender. But I wanted to share with you this, there's a parallel financial system that is arising as a result of these utility tokens. And some of you have probably never heard of them. Some of you probably have. There's a frenzy in the market right now. But this, this market is huge. It's huge. It's a whole new form of venture capital where startups are now funding their, their businesses through issuing utility tokens on a blockchain. And the, again, these tokens are redeemable for consumptive goods in their network, but they're also a way to finance the company in a way that traditional venture capital is it's supplanting traditional venture capital. And folks, here's the number. In the first quarter, $6.3 billion was raised in the initial coin offering market. That is 40% of the initial public offering market in traditional stock markets. That only raised 15.6 billion in the first quarter. And the amount of, and it's 30% of the venture capital raised in the first quarter. So you've got a market that didn't even exist three years ago that's now 40% of the size of the IPO market and 30% of the size of the venture capital market. Uh, there's, this Bitcoin thing is a thing, and, um, it's, and, and I think it's fantastic because it's all happening in parallel and completely outside of the traditional financial system. And all of the tokens that are issued and traded on blockchains are, are, in, on, are, are traceable back to the owner. And in, in conclusion, let me say, I think capital markets won't be fair unless and until they use honest ledgers. And the great thing about the utility tokens is that they are using honest ledgers where the real owner is the record owner that's recorded in the ledger. The assets are issued, traded, and settled on a blockchain. I really do believe that the future of money, to make reference to the theme of this event, the future of money is Bitcoin, and also believe that the future of capital markets is blockchain. Thank you. With that, I think we'll take some questions. Throw box microphones. Clay, are they back there? They're right here. Uh, you, you can throw it. It's soft-sided if you care to. So we're asking for, uh, to give a short, succinct question to Caitlin rather than a, a monologue or a soliloquy. Uh, so just to get us started, Caitlin, should I buy Dole Pineapple? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, that was, Dole was acquired in a management buyout. It's actually now a private company. So technically, I don't think you can buy securities in Dole right now. Um, I'll, I'll find something else. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate. What recognize that what happened to Dole was not its fault. It was the accounting system of Wall Street, and it happened completely independent of Dole. So Dole's general counsel got stuck with this mess of them not knowing who owned their securities. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of, if you think about it, the most basic thing in capitalism is who owns the companies, and we've royally screwed up that accounting system on Wall Street for sure. Yes. Hi, Caitlin. Um, so my name's Brenda, and I'm a trader, and I um, have a question for you. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the Feds um, creating their own tokens and their own block? Uh, you yes, know, Fed coin. Off? Yes. Yes. Uh, I think it's coming, but ironically, um, the Fed is way behind. Maybe you can say that's good, but uh, the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Canada, and the Bank of England are way ahead, and I think they'll be the first ones that issue fiat money on a blockchain. That's not really going to be on a blockchain because, of course, there's a central counterparty. 
So it's not a true blockchain because they're going to be controlling the, the value of it. But at least you'll have what that would do is pull the banking system out of the process of money creation and essentially just have it all done at the central bank. So it will be a lot more transparent. We all know the drawbacks of fiat money, but having more transparency in actually looking at all of those transactions happening in a transparent blockchain coming in and out of a central bank would be an improvement over what it is today. And it would take a lot of that intermediary counterparty risk and settlement delay. I wouldn't be shocked if central banks go there first. But by the same token, the speed with which things are moving in this blockchain industry is staggering. And the, you, the governments can't shut it down. They'd have to shut down the entire internet. And the core developers of the Bitcoin blockchain have made sure that even if they shut down the internet, the Bitcoin blockchain will keep going. You know how they did it? They sent up satellites. So they're outside of the traditional ISP infrastructure. These guys, are, the cypherpunks are hardcore <laughs> Mises Institute supporter types. Um, they've thought of everything, right? And, and Godspeed, because the Bitcoin blockchain cannot be shut down. Yes. Caitlin, in your time in uh, Wyoming, do you get the sense that the people surrounding this gentleman who appears to be a force of nature, do you get the sense that the people in the legislature actually get it? I mean, and how did that, how did they achieve that? Yeah, good question. Wyoming is special for a whole lot of reasons. It's a pretty libertarian place anyway. Um, it's the place that created the limited liability company in, in 1977. Um, so it's actually the place where um, it's third behind Delaware and Nevada for new business registrations anyway. So it already had that franchise. And it's also kind of a, you know, likes to take on the feds every now and then. So we had some interesting ethos of um, in the legislature. It's a citizen legislature, and it was constitutionally restricted to meeting for no more than 20 days. Um, and it takes a minimum of 13 days to get a bill through. So it's designed not to get legislation passed. It's, it's just awesome. Everybody after the legislature had to go back to their, regu to their real job. Um, and so how many people understood it? A lot of folks didn't understand the depth of it. But what they did understand was that there is something special here. And they're looking to diversify Wyoming's economy. It costs them nothing to pass these bills. We, we didn't ask for anything from the state. We just asked for enabling legislation that would allow software companies to come in. Once you made the pitch on that basis, it was very easy to get this, to get this through. Um, and it's also interesting, a lot of the ranchers have now picked up blockchain technology. Wyoming, it's the least populous state uh, and, and it has something like five times the number of cattle as people in the state. Um, so the ranching industry is a big industry. And one of the big senators who, is, who was a big supporter just tagged his, all his calves with RFID chips so that he can verify the provenance of the Wyoming beef. That's important because there are, there are not FDA approved slaughterhouses in Wyoming. Um, and so the, the cattle go outside of the state and they get mixed in with cattle in other states. So any sort of branding of Wyoming beef is impossible. But there are places in the world, like we think of Kobe beef as a premium beef. Um, Taiwan loves Wyoming beef, and it's really hard to get the beef to Taiwan because it gets mixed up with other cattle. So there's a real problem to which having a blockchain, which would allow people to track the provenance of those calves, is a solution. It doesn't require a utility token, but what it did was this, these ranchers would never have understood that as a solution to their problem until we came in and got these blockchain bills passed, and now that there are so many ranchers trying to, trying to get in um, to this uh, to this pilot project. It's just, it's just awesome what's happened. So the state's really behind it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a special place. Interestingly, it's also a place where that respects privacy. Uh, when you register a Wyoming LLC, you just have to give the name and address of the, pri of the primary member. You don't have to disclose everybody else who's invested in it. And of course, because there's no income tax, the state doesn't, doesn't collect any information about the revenues of the LLC as well. So you can kind of see how the ethos matches with the ethos of privacy uh, and self-sovereignty in, in, uh, in the crypto market. It's really interesting. Uh, yes. the, where did the blue um, box go? Yes. Yeah, here we are. Um, I have uh, one question, which uh, this relates to Australia yep. and the electrical demands of uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they actually had to turn on a uh, de, um, a um, non uh, uh, a po uh, uh, an extra power plant yep. in order to meet the electrical demands, yep. and so if we're at a, na a very nascent point 
in the development of this technology and given how tapped out our electrical resources are now already, uh, this is, I think, a question I would like uh, perhaps to be addressed. The other uh, issue is I was one of the victims of MF Global, yep. where oh, I discovered this issue of rehire. Rehypothecation, yep. which was a term it's I had fraud. never heard before, yep. and yet I understand that this is widespread, yes. and I wish um, you would go into greater detail on how this actually comes about and how it's been legitimately um, uh, sanctified within yep. our legal system. On the first question on Bitcoin mining costs, this book handles that brilliantly, and he takes it head on and says, you should want it to be difficult to produce your monetary unit. You should want it to be expensive. And the fact that it is expensive is what gives Bitcoin its value in part because you cannot easily create more. It is expensive to create more. Now the reality is it's very easy to, to, to criticize Bitcoin for the utility, for, for the energy cost. Nobody asks the question, what do Visa and MasterCard and all these other payment processors use? Computing, it requires electricity. And all the data centers around the world, think about what's, what's the majority of computing power being applied to? It's financial transactions. If you really look at um, the computer power used in existing networks, which is opaque and not out there for the world to see, and compare it to Bitcoin, my guess is Bitcoin doesn't look so bad. Um, but uh, this guy's defense is fantastic. We have five minutes left, um, and I would encourage you to read it. On the rehypothecation, um, look, I think that I don't, it, it's, it's fractional reserve banking, okay? I, I, um, I, I do think that it's fraud. I think it should be disclosed to people that this is happening. Um, I personally moved my brokerage account to a broker where I didn't think an MF Global would happen because he didn't have an incentive to grab my securities if they needed them. Um, but I'm nervous about my securities for all of these reasons, and um, that's why I put some of my wealth into the uh, into into crypto, um, uh, and of course other things like gold too. But uh, in any event. Um, uh, it, this is not widely known and understood. It's part of the reason why um, uh, it's certainly MF Global, Refco, Lehman Brothers, they all had, they all were a lot more leveraged than anybody thought because of rehypothecation. It is fractional reserve banking. We all understand that that's not, um, that that's fraud, uh, common, common law fraud. Um, and the Fed sanctions it. This is how monetary policy is, is affected. It's through the repo market. So this is openly sanctioned policy. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, in the 1980s, personal computers came into our lives. Uh, the IBM PC emerged as the leader, largely because it was one of the first to market. Yep. Bit Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency to market. Now there are many others. Yep. Do you see that uh, Bitcoin will be the uh, winner in this contest, or do you think yeah. any of the other cryptos are worthy? Nobody knows, but I'm 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 Nigerian in the way I think about money. I think money is whatever people use as a medium of exchange, and um, it shouldn't be you know um, uh, um, dictated by fiat. And I don't think it should necessarily be gold. It's whatever emerges as as money. Um, my thought on Bitcoin is that. It probably will be the one that stays because it's so far ahead on its network effects. There are superior technologies out there that have been built on uh, that have built on this solution to the Byzantine generals problem, but Bitcoin has a huge head start on all of them. And the other thing that Bitcoin can do is they can adopt um, the the architectural changes, the improvements in technology, if they work. So the way I think about, you know, Litecoin and Monero and some of these other cryptocurrencies that are out there that have that have gotten some traction, but they're a lot earlier in the adoption phase than Bitcoin, they may supplant Bitcoin, but I think they probably won't because if those technologies work, the Bitcoin core developers will adopt them into Bitcoin. So in 20 years, Bitcoin won't be what it what it looks like today. Most of the lines of code that Satoshi wrote have been rewritten. It's going to be written, rewritten again and again and again in 20 years. It won't look like it, but it will still be called Bitcoin, and it'll just evolve um, with, with, uh, with new technologies. Um, one of the questions earlier I didn't answer very well was um, implicit was the scaling question and, and using all of the power. What's happening now 
is um, th there's something called Lightning Network, which, is ha which, is, which was adopted by Litecoin first. So again, the laboratory where the Bitcoin developers could look at it and say, yeah, this actually is something that will help us scale, where essentially they're creating digital escrow. So you're not actually trading the Bitcoins on the blockchain, but you're actually validating that, they're, that they haven't been spent yet using the blockchain. And so that can allow us to have a lot of small value transactions using your Bitcoin on your phone to buy a cup of coffee. Um, if you don't want to use the main chain for that, you can use what's called the Lightning Network uh, and have second layer um, uh, transactions in small value. And then those are all netted when you close the escrow and report it to the, uh, to the, the main blockchain. So that's one of the ways I think it will scale. Maybe do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, fascinating. Thank you very much. The one question I have is, do you see, and I guess if you just read the Wall Street Journal, generally you, you can gauge financial acceptance at large financial institutions to a certain degree, evidently yep. by, because it, it is a phenomenon that is, they can't stop. Yep. At the same time, um, because of largely, you, you've just shown us the massive interest that the financial institutions have in maintaining the system the way it is. Do you see major pushback from the effort and the grand concern that I typically have, and I think we all have in this room as, as being Austrians, is some knucklehead at an institutional level will try to usurp and command and control the system itself. Yeah. Um, Technologically, thoughts? they can't. Okay. They can't. It, because you have to amass all of the computing power to do that. And that would cost billions. And because of the specialized chips that are used in the industry, it would be ev evident to everybody if somebody new was coming in and trying to amass those chips because they're being manufactured as fast as they can. Now, if, and if that happens and the price goes up, new manufacturers will start manufacturing them. So everyone will know if there's a, n a big new player trying to come in and take over the, the processing um, power. It's very distributed, that processing power. There, I looked this morning, 10,260 nodes running the Bitcoin network all around the world, very distributed. So Goldman Sachs can't co-opt it. Um, but they can and will get in and try to financialize it by creating moneyness of it. Um, and Goldman just hired a Bitcoin trader. Part of me, first of all, I take my hat off to them because they were they had the guts to be early, and, and they always were. Um, from my perspective, they had people hanging around this in the early years. When I was afraid at Morgan Stanley, I'd get fired for putting my head up. Goldman folks were not afraid of getting fired. They were encouraged, um, was my experience, to, to, you know, to be curious about this. So I'm not surprised that they were the first to hire a cryptocurrency trader. Um, but I think what they're going to do is try to create financialized versions of this. They're going to create fractional reserved, um, uh, yeah, I know you I see your face cringe, uh, cr cr fractional reserved Bitcoin. But the, the great thing about Bitcoin is we're, we have ways to fight back on that. Um, the vast majority of us Bitcoiners are what we affectionately call ourselves, call hodlers, which is a misspelling of the word hold. We are not going to make our Bitcoin available as collateral. And there'll be some who can fractionally reserve it, but this is, this is the, the genius of Satoshi, the decentralized alternative to central banking. The holders of it um, control it, and we are not going to be making our Bitcoins available to Wall Street to fractionalize it. Let me, let yep. me follow up with that. When you say we're not going to collateralize it, um, meaning that it wouldn't be an asset to be hypothecated, to be yes, pledged. Yes, to rehypothecate it, yep. It, 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 do you, is there any school that would characterize that as a restriction? Of course. Of, of <laughs> the Keynesians. <laughs> well, well, okay, okay. <laughs> Accepting that, but, yeah. but put the knuckleheads aside. <laughs> let's, let's say, is there some school of thought that would characterize that as a restriction on the on the marketability, so to speak, yes. of that type of money. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there will be some percentage of these coins that folks will make available for rehypothecation. It's not everybody who holds it that um, has the cypherpunk mentality, but the vast majority of Bitcoins are held by people who have that mentality. And so um, they're, they're literally in cold storage. I'm never giving mine up to, um, to use as, as securities lending. And unlike in the Refco situation or MF Global, 
nobody's going to be able to grab those because if you, if you custody your own private keys, you own your Bitcoin and you're, you, you're in control of your destiny. If you keep your private keys at a company like Coinbase, you're in no different position than you are putting a bank deposit at Wells Fargo. You have an IOU from them. But that company becomes the central administrator. And, yeah, and, and they're, yeah. And then what about concerns of, of regulatory application to that? Yeah, no question the regulators, if this really takes off, are going to um, restrict it a lot more. But they'll never be able to shut it down. And the fact that Goldman Sachs and now JP Morgan hired a cryptocurrency trader, part of the reason why I think that that's actually good is because the establishment now is, is creating some vested interest in keeping this thing going. Uh, that doesn't mean that they'll succeed against the regulators, but I think if Bitcoin, if, if the regulators wanted to shut Bitcoin down, they would have done so already. I have to stop there because I got to hop to the airport. I'm afraid, I, I'm, afraid I'm not going to be able to chit chat afterwards. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Great questions. Thank you.